I wanted to start with something that actually touches on the theme of this podcast, which is the selling with love. And right from the beginning, you speak in your book about why you love salespeople. While most of the world actually either hates, disdain, or hate, like has this negative association with salespeople. So let's start with where your love comes from. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's really funny. When I wrote the book, I really wrote it for salespeople. And and you're right. In the in the first section, it says I love salespeople, and I do. And you know, I'll I'll tell you why, and then I'll tell you kind of what inspired me. You know, I just think we are people that are change agents. We 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 really help companies grow. We help the economy grow. We you know put our kids through college. You know, we we can stretch as salespeople, especially if you have a lot of variable comp. And if you're really bringing it, if you're really performing, you have the ability to make an extra you know, piece of compensation that you can do a lot of things with. And at the end of the day, that's just on the personal side, but even just what we do for companies, right? Like think of everybody that you work with at your company and, you know, you're helping them make their mortgage. You're helping them put their kids through school, you know, and if this is what you celebrate, you, you're you helping them put uh, presents under the tree. There's, there's just so much power in what we do. Um, and I would say love too, right? Like w- if we're really caring about people, we're solving problems. And that was one reason I wrote the book. Um, I, I've been coaching, consulting for years, and I'd come across salespeople and be like, you know, how are you creating value? How are you getting someone's world? And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Let's let's back this up. If I can help you see the world differently and connect more powerfully by seeing what's below the surface, then you can be of a lot more service and solve a lot more problems. And we get back to helping families, helping the economy, helping solve problems. And so this was really... This is my favorite book that I've written, but it, it, I think it's because it's fun, it's easy to read, but it's for salespeople. Like it's not heady. Um, I think it's from the heart. It's a heartfelt book to support people that I love. <laughs> it's so funny because you know we're talking about sales, and for people who might not be as much into the industry, they're like, "What? They're talking about yeah, heart? They're the talking what? about what? care? What? They're talking about love?" Exactly. This is not my reality or at least my assumptions that I have around sales. And, you know, I've often asked the question to non-salespeople, asking them what they think about salespeople. And, you know, a lot of these negative associations come up. And I I typically am someone who is speaking to the non-salespeople about why sales is a beautiful thing, exactly how you described it. But I wanted to speak from your perspective because you work more specifically with people that wear the salesperson hat. Sure what is the traditional self image that people that are in sales have of themselves and how does that either support or hold them back from actually being the best they can be in their role? Yeah, I'm going to tell a story here too that's in the book, but I'm going to answer that first. I think anybody that's in sales, especially when we talk about why we got into it, one of the things I explore in the book is what's your why? What, you know, what are you playing for? Because I do think it's important as salespeople to center ourselves to because we are going to have some hard days. Um, but we're going to have some really fun, awesome days too. But, you know, I think for me, um, I tell a story in the book. I'm going to tell two really brief ones. One is I'm a young guy. I'm working in the financial industry. I come home. Uh, I go car shopping with my sister and my dad. And this this car salesman's doing everything right, asking problems. Oh, this is for your daughter. She's going off to school. It's a Volvo. It's going to be safe. Like he's doing everything right. My dad finally just looks at him and goes, why would I trust you? You're a car salesman. Oh, I still, I still feel that right now. Like it, it just was kind of like a dagger. Like, what are you doing? This person's doing a great job, doing a service. He's solving this problem for my sister, and you hit him like that. And I think, uh, you know, for me at that moment, I, I mean, I still remember that. That was twenty to thirty years ago. So I, I think we all have head trash we need to get through because of TV, because of the, the, they're great movies, like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Wolf of Wall Street, like those, those are powerful, entertaining movies, but it's not reality. And so I think for us, and, and I did tell you, I would tell a second story, but I'll pause that in case we tell it later. But, you know, I think for me, um, a lot of us feel like if if we're manipulate, like we're supposed to manip- manipulate or convince or, you know, persuasion, how, how good of a persuader you are. And, and all of that to me is parlor tricks. That's not what you do. It's about true understanding. And I think any salesperson listening, if you can get real with yourself and say, why did you do this? It was probably to help people and, and help yourself too. But like you probably have a natural talent to connect with people and help them see a new reality. And that's that's what it's all about in, in my world. You know, I have to say, Carl, I feel like we're having a conversation in an echo chamber because, you know, everything you're speaking about is exactly yeah. what I'm speaking about yeah. as well. And what I like, you know, the, the the thing that I think, you know, I want to highlight here from the, the audience that you work with and from your story is this whole idea that as a salesperson, there's a lot of your own, like, um, I think you call it head trash. 
Yep. And these stories that come up from these ideas that have happened, you know, for you, you're talking about 20 years ago and that sticks with us. And, you know, people are very, very quick to take a jab at a salesperson. And so you need to build that emotional resilience. You need to build that kind of self-trust, which I think can actually be quite emotional because you're very tied to performance. And, uh, you know, we have the greatest of dopamine highs when things go right and the biggest crashes when things might not go so right. And so what are some of the things that you suggest to people when it comes to regulating your emotions or maybe just understanding your emotion about this joyride of being a salesperson? I am so glad you asked that. Um, I think any human, uh, the more self-aware you can be, you know, are you being present? Are you getting pulled off of your center? And and I think for some of us, we don't know it's happening and others that might be really in tune with, you know, I don't feel good or I, I'm kind of dizzy or gosh, I just feel like I'm being a jerk to my kids. What is wrong? I'm not a jerk. You know, those are, those are like your dashboard, your control panel. It's lighting up. There's something going on. So I I think the first thing with so many things like this is when you are having a tough time, just realize you're having a tough time. And, you know, um, why is your control panel lighting up? What happened? Is it is it this thing that you said and you got misunderstood? I I had a conversation with a a, a client slash business partner yesterday and I said something from the heart to him and he reacted and took it very personally. And that was yesterday. And I'm still like a little sensitive about it because I care about him so much. But at least I know that's why I feel like a little edgy when I and, and, and um, have a little bit of still like uh, unsettledness because I do care about him. And I was bringing forward my true self. I was being really authentic. And so I think I would just say part of the solution when you're having a rough day is recognizing and then finding the way that you rebuild. You know, maybe it's going on a walk. Maybe it's yoga. Maybe you work out. Uh, maybe you listen to music really loud. Um, maybe you run outside and scream. But but you but I think getting in tune with who you are and then working through that after you recognize it is part one and part two. Like I said, you know why are you doing this in the first place? What do you play for? There's a reason that's the first part of the book. And I think is is we can get back to center of like what where where are we going? Why are we going there? It it fills us. And you know the tough times can be really tough. Um, I'll say one other thing. Good times are great. But I've also found this in my personal experience. When I am not hitting my quotas, when I'm not hitting the numbers, when revenue is getting a little scary, trust yourself, come up with a plan, work the plan, and just just trust that you know what you're doing and, and, and that you you can play this game and you can play it well. And, and I always kind of just say, I just have to work my plan. I just have to work the funnel. I just have to stay really present in this because sales is kind of a roller coaster some days. It's a roller coaster. And I think, we underestimate how much emotions and care we put into every transaction. And I know for, you know, in your yes. concept, you talk about being very like lifetime value mindset. That that involves you giving a crap about the people you serve. <laughs> that is exactly and right. That's exhausting. And it, like, if you're going out and you're doing a lot of prospecting, you're doing research, it's like putting units of care towards every mm-hmm. single person on that pipeline. And so what have you found are some of the key things that allows you to increase your capacity for caring more at scale without burning out? Wow. I'm not sure I have a great answer off the top of my head for that, but I guess I would say kind of like what we said already, like, why are you doing this? Getting a plan. And for me, I guess I am good. I, I do know the answer. For me, I get excited when I create an experience, when I have connection. Connection feeds me. And I think a lot of salespeople are like this, right? Now, it might be the rush, the fun. Uh, I, I, I won high fives around the office. But it also, I, I would bet it's also that connection with that other human being who had a problem, you solved it. And yeah, that you might have rung the bell because you're in a sales team and that's the culture you're in. But I think deep down, um, even if you're in a culture like that, it's about you made a difference. And so I find that when I kind of bottom out, the more experiences I can create for other people, my kids, my family, my wife, friends, a client, I can do something nice for them. I can do something thoughtful where I've changed their reality and they give me the energy back. So it's kind of one plus one equals three. Then I start to fill my battery up faster and faster. So I don't know about other people, but for me, you got to find the thing that that gets you excited again. And for me, it's being of service. It's it's thinking of something, um, sending but some somebody something, like making an introduction, getting more proactive about connection, and and putting it out there so that it'll, it'll reflect back to me. Yeah, I like that. I think for for me, uh, from my perspective, is the fact that when I'm 
when I'm dealing with the kind of client that is fun to do business with and like that you see that they're actually having a problem that they're looking to solve, that becomes a very fun sales process, a fun conversation. You're like investigating. Um, but, but there's also seems to be like the pressure for like hitting quotas, doing some, you know, colder outreach and you're, you're not always dealing with, you know, the most amazing potential clients. And so do you set some sorts of gateways or like, uh, I don't know, a litmus test to limit how much care goes out if you're not feeling that it's reciprocated in the way that they're kind of connecting with you? You know, I, I, I don't think I do other than just being careful, but I will tell you, as you were talking, I thought of two conversations I had recently. One is a friend of mine that's been a sales coach and a contributor for years. And he's convinced that if he doesn't go to a coffee shop every morning and start a conversation in line, the rest of his day is tanked. He needs that rush of connection to start his day, just like he needs that caffeine. I have another friend, I was actually talking to him today, and uh, he said, you know, I get distracted easily. He goes, we kind of live in a, in a distraction society, phone scrolling, it's distraction, distraction. He goes, I really believe momentum creates momentum. So the first thing I do is I, I, I get up in the morning, I start to connect with the people that I know want to talk to me. And then from there, I've got momentum to take through the rest of the day. So I think it gets back to, you know, how do you want to be in it? Um, but for me, you know, I, I think it's, it's trying to find the little wins everywhere. And, and I play for change. That's a big part of what I'm about. So it doesn't have to be a big, I don't have to boil the ocean. As long as I'm get, starting to see a little bit of change here and there, it usually carries me forward. Usually. Yeah. I love that. And actually from that, I'm definitely going to take away the whole momentum thing is starting with your warmest leads so mm -hmm. that at least motion starts and you got a bit of a smile on your face. That kind of becomes contagious on your future conversations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's so funny. I'm having so much fun talking with you because I see that we we have a lot of the similar kind of concepts and it's refreshing, but I haven't even touched on the word iceberg much, which is actually one of the key things I wanted to speak about with you here. So I, I know like from the beginning, you know, you talk a lot about how everything is an iceberg and, That's right. you know, I know this concept applies not just to you know, an 80, 20 in a specific part of sales. Uh, but I'd love for you to kind of elaborate on the metaphor. What made you chose, choose an iceberg uh, here? And what, what's kind of the inspiration behind this whole theme? Yeah. So for years, I've, I've, I've had icebergs in my lessons and my decks when I talk and I speak, but I never made it the front and center. It was always around, you know, how are we going to become better salespeople? Well, we're going to become better salespeople by really understanding everything. And I put an iceberg up. And then as I started to kind of go on the adventure of writing this book and exploring, you know, what's something that we could all grab on really quickly. The, the book's a short read. It's fun. There's a lot of stories. It was built that way because me personally, I don't, I have a tough time reading for a long period of time. I need to get a piece of information and then go and go and go and stories help. So it's like, there's a lot of people probably like me in sales where, gosh, just don't make it heady, make it fun. So before I know it, I, I learned something. And as I was writing it, I was like, wow, if I could just get people to remember one thing that everything is an iceberg and we only see, you know, 20%, 10% above the surface, if we could start to figure out how to look below it and remind ourselves of that and start to see our spouse as a, an iceberg, our kids, our parents, could we start to have stronger, better relationships? And, and gosh, who doesn't want that? And if the world could start to have better and better relationships, well, I think more things become possible. And as we see other places of commonality underneath the iceberg and, and understanding, um, we don't necessarily need to agree. We just need to understand. We can, we can build relationships. We can make the world a better place. So it's like, I'm going to call it iceberg selling. Uh, you know, and, and it was so that people just really remember that. And, and the fun part was this summer when I finished the book, I was actually in northern Canada in a little town called Churchill with my youngest son, just the two of us. And we were looking for polar bears and we saw polar bears and, you know, there's icebergs up there, right? And, this is a, and so it was kind of befitting that at the end of when I finished this book, I was on vacation there, you know, I was, a, I was in the Arctic. And, and so to me, it's just a simple way to remember it. And then, you know, folding within it, I created some best practices that I think are pretty logical and easy to follow. But, you know, if one, if you just walk away knowing that, gosh, what if I could see underneath the water, what, what would my life be like? What would this relationship be like? Um, then, you know, to your point, we're kind of selling with love or figuring out things. So that was the inspiration. I love it. 
And if, if I grasp myself on, on some of the, the concepts you share about, and you know, if you're doing any kind of sales interaction, and obviously we're, we're investigating, right? We're trying to find out what are the real problems. And what you see, which is going to be like the 10% of the iceberg, are going to be the things that people kind of tell you at the surface, which I find that if we want to really get to build that rapport and, 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 and see that we understand that client, we have to be able to see what's underground. That's where most of the information is. But I think we're naturally guarded. It's, it's, there's this duality, right? It's like, oh my God, I want to have more genuine conversations. I want to have more genuine connections, but I don't want to share anything that's too vulnerable of me. And so as a salesperson, how do you earn the right to be able to get to that level where you're having conversations that are beyond just the surface? I'm so glad you asked that because to me, when I say everything is an iceberg, we are too, um, as salespeople, as human beings. And so I also think what's great about salespeople is in general, we're pretty confident. Now, you know, when we have our heart to hearts, when we're having a beer with our friends, we might be like, gosh, someone's going to find out. I don't know what the heck I'm talking about, but it, you really do. You really do. You know, you, you know, if you've even sold for a year or two, you know what you're doing. You know, you, you understand the mechanics and you have to have some comments because you, because unlike any other job, we put ourselves out there every single day. So um, I, I guess I'd encourage you that you're already used to putting yourself out there. And um, a lot of people in sales are very independent. That's why we did it. We're independent. We want to make our own future. We want to better on ourselves. So this is my bridge to answering your question. The more authentic you can be with yourself, the more you can bring that to the conversation. Like even at the first, hey, I'm glad you you called. I just got back from lunch and I, I had a really nice time with my wife. And we kind of talked about what it was like to have kids in high school right now. Like He just said that in the beginning of my sales call? Yeah. Cause I'm a real human being and that's what just showed up for me. And guess what? Most likely that other person's going to be like, Oh, wow, that's really nice. You know, that's a great idea. I should maybe do that too. And now we've already begun at a place that's, that's with trust and rapport instead of having to like gamify this, how are we going to figure this out? How am I going to win? You know, it's like, I'm not going to win. I'm going to connect. I'm going to be of service. I'm going to figure this stuff out. So I think to me, if, if, if you, really want to understand somebody else's iceberg, start sharing some of yours um, and, and be authentic and be a little vulnerable. Um, and you're going to, you're going to see some amazing things happen. Um, that's been my experience. I want to, I want to throw something at this because I've had some conversations with others um, who felt that when you build rapport and you connect on things that might be outside of the scope of the product and the solution that you want to bring is is actually uh, taking you further away from your objective of creating a transaction. Uh, I see here this has worked for you. Have you had some pushback around this theory of people saying like we should be sticking to the point and just, you know, making transactions happen because now we're wasting time? Yes, I have. Um, I can think of one. I think there's, there's a mindset that's that hasn't doesn't know what this means yet. So they haven't had this reality. So they've, they're like, I'm doing fine. I'm hitting my numbers. Why do I need to change? Right? Okay. Well, then I'm going to probably ask some questions like, well, are you happy? You know, do you feel connected? You know, uh, well, I'm making the money. Yeah. But do you like your job? You know, and, and maybe they say, yes, it's not a one size fits all, but I guess what I would say there's, there's sometimes there's a lack of awareness that there's even a new reality. I will tell you also, one of the things that I've consulted on for years is building sales engines. And I'll go into like the SMB, the small mid market. And many of the times when people talk sales, they're only talking bottom of the funnel. Like, you know, I want a lead that's ready to buy. And this is what I'm going to tell them. And I'm going to give them this and this and feature and benefit. And then I'm going to give them this. And then at the end, if they're excited, I'm going to give them a deal they can't walk away from. And that's how we close. Okay, fine. But I got to tell you, the sales starts way before then. One of my other books is called Sales and Marketing Alignment. And it's really the concept of like, what is this entire buyer's journey and how do I meet them along the way? And I think the more authentic your brand shows up, the more authentic your people show up, your messaging, um, it's going to be more of a magnet. You might not win everything, but if you're inauthentic, it can push people away. So I, I think it's kind of this whole, what are you playing for? Are you just playing for like churn, 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 churn? Or are you playing for something that's a lot more solid? And so that's usually the conversation. And sometimes it's hard. Because somebody's writing checks, they're investing, and they're like, I just need more sales. It's like, okay, let's let's take a step back and start exploring all that. But for me, um, it, it, it's 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 kind of a quality quantity play. Like the more quality sales we have, the higher lifetime value, the more impact we have, the more we're changing things. I want that in my business. So that's kind of my point of view on that. Yeah. It's so funny because I, I, I speak about 
you know, there's some techniques that do exist that are quite, uh, let's call them aggressive for the sake of just calling it something everybody would understand what it is. Aggressive sales tactics. And you might get a close rate that goes from like 5% to 7%. Great. A couple dollars come in. But the, you know, 95% of the people that didn't buy right away with your previous technique might end up buying in a much higher likelihood, maybe an increase by 50% because you actually treated them with respect, authenticity, and you didn't kind of... Uh, you know, alienate them with the the scarcity or the aggressiveness. And yeah, you got the extra 2% on the front end, but all of that long-term value and brand building, it's like, okay, you've extracted the egg from the goose by sticking your <laughs> hand inside the goot and ripping it out. Great. Now right. the goose is pretty traumatized and not so willing to produce more eggs. Um, would, would it be all right if I told a really quick story about this? Please. So I go into this company um, and there's, I'm going to kind of make it brief, but there is this woman that was there who was selling pretty okay. There was five people on the sales team. But when I came in um, to kind of become a fractional leader, the current guy was like, we need to let her go. You're going to find that we need to fire this person. I said, okay, well, I appreciate that. But I want to learn why you said that. And I'm going to spend some time with this person before I make any rash judgments. So I start to investigate the whole sales organization, what's going on our sales ethos. And this woman says, you know, the, the way we're supposed to sell is a 25-minute appointment. And we're supposed to consultive sell. I need at least 45 minutes. I go deep. I ask a lot of questions. And if I could just sell my way, I know my close rate would be a lot higher, a lot higher. I said, okay, well, let's talk about this. Let's role play. Like, tell me current state and what you wish. And we did that. I was like, huh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to believe you. You're the eyes and ears. You know what's right for you. And yeah, if we could be put a little bit more time in instead of like trying to book up as many appointments we could per person, what will happen? Will the sales... Uh, Will the sales close rate as the team rise? Will it be the right move? So I kind of asked for some permission, a little bit of forgiveness. And I go, you've got a month and I'm going to back you no matter what. And I want you to sell your way. Well, the story is <laughs> we, we ended up following her lead, changed the whole way the organization sold, didn't just make 25 minute appointments. And I would say 80% of the months she was the top performer and they were going to let her go. And so the story is, you know, she was putting her heart and soul and she really wanted to bond with this person, understand and guide them where the other people were much more transactional. That was the culture I'd come into. And then we switched much more to listing, spending time, kind of this iceberg. That was probably like iceberg V, you know, V1.2375 or some crazy thing like that, right? But, um, but you know, I, I think a lot of it's just like, if you're not sure, then run a pilot, try something different, compare the numbers. They're not going to lie. Um, and in this case... We ended up with a much happier sales team and more revenue and a lot of good things happen. Speaking of that amount of time, and again, it comes with this like limited amount of care or time that we have in a day and uh, making the most out of every interaction so that it actually leads to the results we need both for being fulfilling and to hit the sales quotas. Um, you do emphasize a lot and you start with some of the big pra best practices about doing the research. And again, it's not just doing the 10%, but going way deeper. How have you seen that translate into results? Like how much research is enough versus too much research that you're just spending all your time? How do you find that balance? You know, that's, I really like that question because oftentimes as salespeople, um, we will have folks that want to do too much research. And, I, and you know, I love salespeople, but I think sometimes what happens is it's easier to do research than to do the outreach. So we get stuck in this, well, I did the research. Carl, you told me to do the research. Like, okay. Let's, what's really going on here? My short gut kind of answer is I ran a digital agency for about 10 years and we were, uh, people wanted to work there. We had a really great reputation, uh, did amazing work. And so when we posted a job, we would get a ton of people to apply. Well, account executives would come in, you know, a, a applying for an account executive job. And one of the first questions I said was, hey, on our website, what was one of your favorite portfolio websites that we made or applications? And if they go, oh, I didn't really spend enough time. I don't really know. I just know you did great work. We, we took the off ramp because if, if, if they couldn't put in enough time before an interview to get a job to just be able to answer some simple questions of who I was, why are they get, how are they going to represent my brand? Why am I going to hire them? They didn't put in the mm -hmm. effort. And I would say it's kind of a quick test like that, too. Like part of it is for you to look for clues so that you can understand that person better when you come in. But the other is, is when you start saying, hey, I saw that podcast. I really like what you said here. You've changed that dynamic. So it's it's more enough that someone knows that you took the time and intentionality to be present and show up with them versus, you know, I know where you went to grade school and your mother's maiden name. Like that's too <laughs> much. <laughs> 
on the first call with a prospect is like, how's Timmy, your second yeah. son? They're like, is this right. a sales call or a threat? <laughs> that was a pretty sweater you had on yesterday. Oh, God. <laughs> oh my Too God. Much. I'm glad you... Pull it back. Too... <laughs> back up a little. But I, I do find that taking at least the initiative to show that you care enough mm -hmm. uh, to have done the what would be a, a reasonable amount of research to show respect to the prospect. Because at the same time, I think a lot of the answers of your research does come better through the conversations, right? And I think that's primarily what we're trying to do as salespeople is to build those kinds of connections. But, at the, you know, I, I love this point. You, you talk about how in sales, sometimes we assume that it's supposed to be some sort of like performance, right? And you've already quoted Wolf of Wall Street and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And oh, do we love Alex Baldwin's opening Absolutely. line in that movie? Alex. Every sales guy's watched it. Uh, if yeah. anybody hasn't watched it, uh, definitely go on YouTube. Uh, Alec Baldwin, uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and you'll see a monologue that was uh, worthy of an Oscar, I believe. I, If not, it should have been. <laughs> so, okay. And to be honest, Carl, I... I this one actually hits close to home because I have a lot of people that come to me to do pitch hacking for them. I have okay. this knack of being able to string together, what's your product? What do you do? Who do you sell to? Here's a pitch. And I go into this performance mode and I can make it sound amazing. But quite frankly, it only impresses other salespeople. I don't think it actually makes a difference to the people who are looking to buy. I'd love for you to elaborate on that point because you speak a lot about it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell a story. Uh, real, I'm going to kind of high level this. So one of the exercises I like to play is kind of scenario based. So I'm running a sales meeting, kind of a sales slash working session. And this is a company that sells professional services to CPAs. And I said, hey, okay, this is what we're going to do. There's a conference for CPAs in Vegas. And the scenario is you're at the conference. What do you say? Who do you meet? What, like, who do you meet? Who do you say? Paint me a picture. And I intentionally went with some of the kind of younger salespeople and I ended with one of the senior partners and it was intentional. And so the first guy did kind of your pitch hack, like, well, Carl, I'd be in the line uh, waiting for a cappuccino and the guy would have a shirt with his CPA firm on it and he would have just ordered and I would have ordered and I would have been like, hey, you're a CPA. Yeah, I am. Hey, do you know we do X for Y and this is da -da -da -da. like the whole like just it was beautiful. And he goes, and then the rest of the time while we're waiting for our coffee, I would ask him some other questions. We get to know each other. I was like, okay, you know, there was nothing textbook wrong with it. But to give you the juxtaposition, I then, you know, eventually, because there was a couple other people in the call, I went to the senior partner and said, can you give me your scenario? Super cool person. This was so cool, like Jedi, like Jedi, right? Master. I would be in a plane and I would have sat down. And the CPA would have sat down next to me. And as they, as we lifted off from the ground, they pull out their laptop and I see the name of the CPA firm. I would say, oh, are you going to Vegas for the CPA show? And they would say, yeah. And I would say, why? How long have you on? And she just started saying, and then I would be like, how long have you been in your firm? Are you a partner? Who old do you work with? You know, have you been to Vegas before? And she just kind of rattled off. She goes, and we would have a conversation about this person and what they were all about. And then near the end, I would probably say, yeah, I'm in the space too. This is the professional services we do. If that's something you ever learn more about, I'd love to give you my card. But if not, this has been a wonderful trip, a wonderful conversation on this trip. The juxtaposition and just even the power of that story, right? The, the partner, the senior partner had framed a get to know me conversation. The other guy had pitched bottom of the funnel. Do you want to buy this thing? It's super cool and shiny and it's better than everyone else's. So for me... There is a time and a place. Like if you only have 30 seconds and somebody said, what do you do? And the guy was a CPA. This is what we do. Oh, okay, cool. But if if you can really architect that experience, which is one of the parts of the iceberg, you know, architect your plan, chart your course. Um, what's the outcome you want? Then why wouldn't you do it? I love that story. And it's so true because we go on YouTube sometimes, at least not for me. And I'll go look at these like, star guru salespeople kind of motivating their other salespeople and it the way they speak and the techniques they share seems to only work on other salespeople oh, other as salespeople in, they're hype men for the other salespeople yeah that's Sorry. it and and so but everything you're speaking about is is so much more about you know trying to understand 
see what the real problem is, dig deeper, not just do the surface level stuff, which brings me to, you know, as we go towards an end of a conversation, it brings to the point that a lot of people feel is the 10% that will create 90% of the results, which is, oh, I just need to learn how to close better. I'm really afraid about closing, but you have a very, I would say short, but to the point perspective on how closing can and should happen when you apply your methodology. Would you be able to share more? Yeah. So the whole concept here with iceberg selling is, you know, if we do some research, kind of step one, step two, chart the outcome we want. Like, and I even in a meeting, I'll tell a client, hey, um, we've got 30 minutes still, right? Yeah. Well, how does this sound? And this is the casualness of it, right? How does this sound? What if for the next 10 minutes, you just kind of told me a little bit about you and what your company's like and your role and what you're looking to do? And then I'll share a little bit about me and how we work. And then um, from there, I, I think I'll have a pretty good idea. Let's just kind of test to see if there's something here. And if there is, let's let's get into some brainstorming, how we might be able to work together and what that might look like. And then if so, let's figure out if it makes sense to keep talking. C- could we do that today? And I mean, everyone says yes. And <laughs> that sounds good. Like, I know there's no smoke and mirrors. I know you're not going to hijack me. I know you're not going to trick me. Awesome. Thank you. And so, you know, as we go through that and we start to build rapport and learn about them and really seek to understand, I start testing to make sure I understand. Did I hear you correctly? And then I get into brainstorm solution. And I might even just say, hey, I, is it okay if I run by some ideas of how this might, we might be able to work together, assuming they're a good fit. And at that point, we start to co-create. And that's the magic. We start to co-create a path forward. And what I have found as I start to do that you know, the old school would be like, well, they're selling themselves. Okay, fine. But what's really happening is they are getting like enrolled in this solution. They've been seen, they've been heard. They understand that you understand where they are and that you have the solution to make their life better. So I find 80, 90% of the time, if I do this, they actually go, what's the next step? How do we move forward? I don't have to be like, so what do you think? Is this, you've said yes a lot. Do you still want to do this? And, and then to cap it all off is this is, something we all know, mutual next step, always do it. And I'll tell you, I don't always do it. And I always should, but it is of service to someone so much. Like if they're like, yeah, what's the next step? This sounds great. Can we get our calendars out right now? Can we find a time to reconnect? And if you're nervous about that, because you're like, well, they're not going to, they're going to feel like I'm a salesperson now. And we just became friends. I'm telling you, you are being of service to them because everybody's busy. And then you start to chase someone because you didn't lock it down. And now you're like, you know, oh, does she still like me? You know, like you don't want to be ghosted and start chasing. And this is how you solve it. You just say, I'd like to find a time. And if you're nervous about that, then say, hey, I'm going to send you the proposal. Why don't we just pencil something in just in case we need to talk? Can we do it right now? Because it's a lot easier to reschedule than to create a new schedule. So that's kind of the real high level, like get in co-creation, get real with someone, um, get them to know that you've got the solution and then Make sure you're of service to to have a nice step and another thing to keep this conversation going. Yeah. Having something back in the calendar is just one of the simplest and it's so gentle. I don't know, like I think we put more weight to it than what it actually is, but the benefits of it is just gonna be the For biggest everybody. thing. It, you 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 actually solve a problem of trying to figure out a schedule. And, oh, believe me, Carl, being here in Asia, like trying to coordinate time zones, you definitely want to do it in person. Uh, after one person sa- sends a booking link, then the other person sends back a booking link right. and you can't find something, you do it right then and there. And, you know, this conversation was so fun, yet so short for the depth of what you explore within your book. There's one final question I love to ask all the guests that come onto the show. Uh, you are on the Selling with Love podcast. So what does Selling with Love mean to Carl Becker? Yeah. I think it's helping, I'm going to say, I'm going to take it to the salesperson. I think it's helping salespeople to realize the value that they really have, the impact they have. I, I uh, was running a session for Semester at Sea, which is a, a ship that takes college kids around the world. And I asked every single person that day, why do you do this? And almost all of them said, because we want to make better global citizens. And so like, wow. Right. So if 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 as a salesperson, you can connect with your mission, your values and be somewhere that's aligned to that and you can help solve problems or in this case, make better global citizens and I can help somebody do that, then I think I am caring. I'm bringing bringing that love forward to, to help people realize just how special they are in the world and how much impact they have. So my uh, my why around love is helping the people on the front lines having those conversations just get into better conversations and change the world. 
I absolutely love it. Now, Carl, I have to say, you're, you're probably not as aware of my material, but one thing you would have to know is in the Selling with Love methodology, the first love is love the impact, which is about answering your why. That's why I'm having conversations with you and I'm yes. like, hell yeah. It's and amazing. I think for everybody listening, uh, you've probably witnessed us having a lot of fun here. Hope you've enjoyed as well. Carl Becker, again, the book has just come out. You definitely want to pick up a copy. We'll have a link into the show notes. You can grab it. It's a fun read, very practical, filled with stories and actually not that long, not filled with the fluff, just going to the point and telling you exactly what you need to do to be able to be more effective as a salesperson. If you are a startup business owner, this will be allowing you to build the basic skills you need to take it to the level where maybe one day you will be be able to hire salespeople. And if you are a full-time salesperson, this is going to be very, very effective to bring you into the right man mindset, take away all that trash in the mind, and really get effective at building long-term relationships with high value that'll increase your bottom line for the company, your commissions, and do it in a way that feels, feels good and is actually fun. Oh my God, we crossed a lot of bridges today. This investigated a few different icebergs, but it was an absolute joy to have you on the show, Carl. Thank you so much for bringing that message to the world. We are supporters here and for everybody else, keep selling with love. Thank you so much for listening to the Selling with Love podcast. We have some previous episodes you can tune into right here. And if you prefer the short form content where you get to the point in under 10 minutes, we do have a ton of clips from our best episodes that are being shared on this channel as well. So pick which one supports you the most. And of course, thank you for liking, subscribing, and of course, selling with love.